Sit back, relax, cause here we go. It's Support Therapy Bonus Show. Oh yeah! Hello, and welcome to a special bonus edition of Pork Therapy. I'm Stephanie, your host, and you can find out more about me at porctherapy.com. It's pork like a porcupine, and I'm not a therapist, but I do have a talk show about happiness and freedom and sort of how we can get more of them in our lives. Who doesn't want that, right? Um, so if you listen, then hopefully you'll you'll pick up some ideas that you like or at least be entertained. That's sort of my goal here. And you can also add my podcast feed over at the website porktherapy.com to get uh, more shows like this. And today I'm very pleased to have with me um, Jake and Hannah. And they are um, some friends of mine, but they also have their own um, websites and, and programs that I want you all to know about. Jake is the host of The Voluntary Life at thevoluntarylife.com. It's a podcast also about personal freedom. So you can tell we already have something in common. And I'm sure you'll like that if you listen to my show at all. And Hannah has a blog called Becoming Who You Are at becomingwhoyouare.net. She's got um, all kinds of articles, coaching, things that center around the idea of authenticity and living and also sort of how you can become happier and more free in your own life. So um, obviously we, we have a lot of stuff that we can relate to each other over. And uh, would you like to say hello, Jake and Hannah? Hello. Hello. <laughs> yeah, you both sound great. You're coming to me from halfway across the world from over in England. And I'm in the US in New Hampshire. So it's nice that we have Skype that we can uh, be able to connect with each other. That's really nice. Yeah, Definitely. it's awesome. It's Skype has its problems sometimes, but it, it is awesome to be able to to chat. Yeah, you know, I prefer Mumble to Skype, um, and Mumble is the program that I actually use to do my live um, show on the Liberty Radio Network. So it's basically a voice chat program that's designed for gaming, actually, and it has low latency and high quality voice sort of transmission. But the only downside is if you want to um, use it like Skype and talk to somebody, you have to have a server set up and the server oh. costs money. So um, mm. it's not, not free like Skype, but it's definitely high quality and it's secure, which um, Skype isn't necessarily secure. Not that that really mm. matters too much to me, but um, it's another alternative that I think is interesting. So, I'll have to check that out. I've not, I've not actually um, seen that one before. Yeah, if you ever do uh, um, end up doing a live show on LRN or somewhere else, maybe that would be um, a good way to uh, stream your audio to the whatever server is streaming out the, the show. Mm. Mm, that sounds interesting. Yes, indeed. Um, so I wanted to talk to you both because we all were recently at the Porcupine Freedom Festival 2012, and that was up in Lancaster, New Hampshire. You all came to visit me. And now I'm sounding like I'm from the South. I'm saying you all, but <laughs> I, I don't like the phrase you guys because <laughs> Hannah's not a guy. And, you know, I, I don't know. It's just not that inclusive. I know people use it to, to refer to mixed genders, but um, I don't know. Something about it strikes me a little bit weird. So I'm, I'm, I've been saying you all, but um, you individuals, I don't know. <laughs> What's the best way to say? <laughs> you people. Just say yeehaw on the end and then it'll sound perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that would be fitting with some of the stuff that you probably witnessed at the Porcupine Freedom Festival. No, we're really not that redneck up here in New Hampshire. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, you recently came for a visit, and you came to um, I guess you flew into Boston, spent a couple of days there, and then uh, we all sort of rendezvoused at the Porcupine Freedom Festival, which is in a very rural pl place in New Hampshire. It's Lancaster, New Hampshire, and it is um, well. To put it in perspective, uh, most people don't get cell phone signal there. Um, there's even the internet is a little bit sketchy. It's difficult to be connected to the outside world. There are lots of mountains though, and fresh air, and animals, and maybe even bugs. Uh, and there were lots of freedom lovers there that week, in particular because it was pork fest. So. I wanted to basically know, uh, this is the first trip that you've taken to New Hampshire. I want to know what you thought and what were your impressions of Porkfest itself. Maybe talk about some of the things that you saw there that you that you liked or didn't like. Um, I'm just kind of curious because I've been living here for six years and I'm an old hat at New Hampshire, but I want to know what sort of some uh, Porkfest virgins or first timers <laughs> thought about it. Well, um just to go first, I, I had a fantastic time. I think we, we had great fun. We really, really enjoyed ourselves, had a great trip. And it was, um, you know, it was, it was just 
lovely to be able to meet up with you again and to uh, meet up with other friends. And, um, and that was sort of the, the best um, aspect of Fest for me, um, mm. was just as an opportunity really to get together with like-minded people um, mostly reconnecting with people who you know, we've we've met before, but also meeting new people, which mm-hmm. was which was mm-hmm. great. Mm-hmm. And um, I thought the uh, visiting New Hampshire was really cool as well. It was really really interesting to see it. It's beautiful, um, and I didn't you know I didn't really I, I sort of imagined New Hampshire being more sort of just um, I don't know rolling hills and farms and stuff, but it's there's like real mountains and hills and forests just. <laughs> Just miles and miles of forest that we saw. And uh, did you see a moose? <laughs> we didn't see any. No, we were okay. a bit disappointed not to no, see we, a moose or a bear. Yeah, we thought we thought we might get to see a bear or something. But that um, was going to be my next question. Did you see a bear? Because the moose is good luck. The bear, well, not so much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of our friends does have, as he puts it, a uh, raccoon-shaped dent in the front of his car now, though. And, yes. Um, I am intimately familiar with this dent. Um. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. This was just for people who weren't there. This is a, a very good friend of all of us who, um, who, uh, well, yeah, essentially hit a raccoon, yeah. and it completely messed up the radiator, and uh, it was a, a a bit of a pain. Mm. Um, yeah, and eventually so. they made it home, but had to had to sort of fix this uh, this raccoon shaped hole, as he put it. Um, mm. So, yeah, I mean, there is a lot of wildlife here in New Hampshire. Um, that's something I think that surprises some people. It did take me about three years before I saw a live moose after I moved to New Hampshire. Um, I remember the first week that I came here, um, I was invited to a potluck with some coworkers. And one of the things that somebody brought was ground moose saute because they had hit uh, a moose Whoa. in their in their van, <laughs> and usually when you hit a moose in New Hampshire, um, if it's an adult moose, anyway, um, your car takes more damage than the moose. Sometimes they'll just walk away <laughs> after a big crash, um, and actually, it's it's no joke because sometimes they can really do some serious damage to somebody's car. But uh, this person, you know, decided to well, when life gave them a moose, they made moose uh, moose lemonade. They <laughs> <laughs> they wow. they made a ground ground moose stew because I guess their their car was pretty much um, wrecked, but mm. at least they they had some uh, food that they could have from it. So that was the first moose that I saw in New Hampshire. But the first live moose wasn't for a couple years after that. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, I know you said you were you came to meet up with people, and I completely agree. Even though I live here, Pork Fest is kind of my vacation and I realize to an extent because I do live here it's sort of like uh, there's this dynamic where it's sort of like uh, I'm hosting a little bit so I feel a little bit um, I don't know not not like obligated or pressured but like I feel like I should kind of you know engage with people and um, you know it, it would be a nice thing to do to kind of show them around and talk to them and answer questions if they have them about about what it's like here and stuff like that um, and I was I was pretty busy the week of Pork Fest, but but the best part, as you said, was getting to see you and getting to see some other people, maybe people that I don't normally get to see in life, like uh, friends on Facebook and stuff like that, friends from far mm. away, and to connect with them in in real time was really cool. Um, so, was there anything else? Did you did you go to many of the talks at Pork Fest? Because I didn't go to too many of them. Um, I I was kind of deterred by thinking they would be on video anyway, and also. Um, I don't know. It was just really busy. I had a lot of stuff that I was kind of working on behind the scenes, like free aid. But yeah, what were what were some of your impressions of the talks if you went to them? I actually didn't go to that many talks. I think because, like you said, I knew that they were being videoed, and I could catch them later on YouTube. And for me, like Jake was saying, one of the real highlights of being there was the people and being able to see you, being able to meet new people, and catch up with some old friends as well that we hadn't seen for a while. And so while we were there, I, I wanted to maximize my time with them. Um, and so I, I sort of made a decision quite early on in the week that um, that took priority over necessarily going to any talks or anything like that. Yeah, um, that makes because, sense. Just simply because I couldn't always see those friends later on, whereas I could catch the talks on YouTube. Mm, very smart. <laughs> yeah, I went to a couple of them and I, I enjoyed um, a couple of them, but I... I still, same as Hannah, I still found it, um, you know, the opportunity of 
seeing people um, was more important. Plus, we did um, we did uh, get to take part in a few um, radio shows, like your one, which was fun. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, both yeah. Hannah and I were on your show. That was really fun, actually, the yeah. live shows. And oh, I gate so crashed um, Free Talk Live and uh, School Sucks. Uh-huh. And Brett very kindly invited me to take part in one of his talks as well. So I did a talk with him. So, yes. yeah, that was that was fun. Yeah, that that was great. And I remember your goal was to be on something every day. And that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that happened on the first day. Brett, um, Brett invited me to do a talk with him. Mm-hmm. And it was a lot of fun. So I thought, oh, dude, that was great. If I could do that again, that'd be good. So, uh, <laughs> so in the end, it turned into a can I gate crash something every single day. <laughs> and did you get, um, I guess, yeah. some inspiration for your own shows and or for your blog, Hannah? Like, did you did you end up like writing anything down that you saw there that you thought, oh, this would be great to make a blog post on when I get back or or this would be a good interview to do later on? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I mean, I think not so much sort of specific topics that I heard about um, inspired me but I think being around people who were talking about freedom and talking about being able to live a free life was incredibly inspiring Mm. uh, in a sort of indirect way Mm -hmm. and it definitely gave me a lot of food for thought yeah Mm. so I don't know um, this is a podcast, of course, so we can edit anything out if you're uncomfortable. But I don't know how much you want to get into sort of like your own ideas about um, moving places for freedom and like your thoughts on how to get more freedom in your in your like location. I know those ideas are still evolving for me and mm. maybe they are for you, too. But it's been interesting to talk to you about those kind of things because I get some new information and new uh, ideas about about sort of where to live to be the most free. And Mm. just from my own experience, I want to hear your thoughts on this, but just from my own experience, you know, back in 2006, um, especially when I, before that I was an undergraduate, I graduated in 2006 from college and I lived in Massachusetts, which is, you know, a skip and a jump away from New Hampshire, you know, like (laughs) very close. And I was thinking about, you know, what do I want to do after I graduate? And I really wanted to move to New Hampshire, not only because it was really easy, but I knew that it would be a big increase in the amount of freedom. And Mm. I I know you're from England, so maybe this, I don't know if there's any kind of uh, commensurate places where you could be, you know, living maybe in a big city or something and then move slightly outside of it and you're suddenly not subject to certain taxes or regulations or whatever. But that was what it was like going from Massachusetts to New Hampshire, uh, where mm-hmm. in, in Massachusetts there was a you know a sales tax and income tax. And so in New Hampshire, they, they have neither one of those. And so immediately I was free of two different taxes that I was paying every single time I saw my paycheck or every single wow. day whenever I bought anything. So uh, so that was a huge reason, and I was I was thinking that even before I was really like a liberty minded person, uh, explicitly I remember thinking, wow, it would be great if I lived in New Hampshire, then I wouldn't have to deal with like uh, something that costs a dollar wouldn't cost a dollar six, it would cost a <laughs> dollar. So. Yeah, it's funny. I really noticed that coming from um, Boston up to New Hampshire, because one of the mm. things that always catches me off guard when I come to the states is is the sales tax and say so you think you're paying a certain amount for something then you take it to the checkout and it's like oh no it's actually you know a few cents more expensive or however much more expensive mm-hmm. and it's it's funny for us because we don't have that here so we obviously we don't have states mm-hmm. so any tax applies to the whole country um so we have a basic rate of 20 percent income tax and then uh, VAT, which is the equivalent of sales tax, which is also 20%, but it's included in the price wow. um, of everything, so it doesn't get added on afterwards. So does everybody uh, pay a, t- a 20% income tax, no matter who they are, or is it a graduated... Uh, no, it's, no, it's you progressive. Get a, you okay. get a certain amount tax-free, but it's a very, very small amount mm. per year. It's like a few thousand pounds. And then, yeah, the basic rate is 20%. And then the more you earn, the more you pay, basically. And it goes up to, I think, 50% now. Yeah, I don't even know wow. what the top rate is. I think now. it's 50% or 45% or something like that. But it's, it, I mean, it's a significant amount of mm. your, your paycheck. Yeah. Um, and we also have something called national insurance as well, which is like your mandatory contributions to your state pension later on and your right to benefits like... Mm. Um, unemployment benefits and things like that and that if you're self-employed that is two pounds 60 a week oh wow so okay it does add up yeah <laughs> quite a lot. 
Yeah, um, yeah. And if you if you earn over a certain amount, then you have to pay another ten percent of your income mm. in national insurance instead of um, as well as the two pounds fifty a week. So oh wow! It's yeah, it's really um, when you talk about um, our thoughts about sort of moving abroad. I can definitely say for me, um, especially because I am fully self-employed at the moment, it's really opened my eyes um, about just how much tax. You have to pay because I think if you're in employment um, and it just gets taken off your paycheck every month, you don't really notice it so much. Mm -hmm. But when you actually have to hand the money over yourself, it feels so much more real somehow, <laughs> and it really uh, it really burns. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to ask you. I mean, what happens to somebody? Like, are there any cases of public people publicly not paying taxes, resisting, or anything like that? And what happens to them if so? We don't really hear so much about We don't have like a tax resistance movement yeah, we, in the same way. I think it's probably quite different, especially to New Hampshire, where people are very vocal about civil disobedience and yeah. um, very public about doing that. Well, we um, even have celebrities. I mean, Wesley Snipes was like a high profile celebrity. He's not a liberty person as far as I know, but and he lives out in California. But he just said, screw this, I'm not paying. And, and he didn't. And he got sent to jail. And, and then, of course, yeah. there are people like uh, what's his was it Larkin Rose or Irwin Schiff who were explicit anarchists or tax resistors and like from a principled mm -hmm. standpoint and you know they've gone to jail too and eventually they get out but uh yeah maybe maybe we do have a little bit more public uh tax resistance so so just nobody ever dares to go outside the system there huh well they, I think people do but they're just not as public about it I mean there are definitely people who avoid paying tax um or evade paying tax, but they, they're a lot more subtle about it, I think. Yeah. Yeah, the, the other thing that, that I think may be a little bit different in the UK is um, there are, uh, I mean, it's not that, they're not that easy to use them, but there are offshore places like Jersey and mm. Guernsey and the Isle of Man. And, you know, there are companies that set up in offshore locations and like that. I'm going to uh, set up on the Isle of Woman. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and you can also have, you know, set up various things like trust funds and stuff like that. Now, I don't think that is as easy in the States um, to do. Like, I think as far as I understand, I don't really know the details of it, but as far as I understand, the IRS is, makes it a lot more difficult for that to happen. So mm. maybe that's partly sort of what's going on is that maybe offshore arrangements mm. are a little bit closer. I mean, mm. they're certainly physically closer. There's a lot of places that are actually part of UK jurisdiction, yeah. which are still offshore um, for tax purposes. Mm. Uh -huh. And it's all, you know, you have to, obviously you have to get a lawyer and work out how to do it all properly, but um, that's maybe a little bit more easily available. And, mm. and the other thing that happens is that, you know, UK people, like pretty much anyone else in the world except Americans and I think Israelis or some, and, and some other country in Africa, uh, UK people can go abroad and be resident abroad. So you can go to a lower tax place mm -hmm. and you can significantly change your tax um, circumstances. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're an American citizen, as far as I understand, even if you go abroad and you're resident abroad, you still have to uh, report. Yeah taxes to the IRS and you still have to essentially you're still liable right <laughs> yep they gotcha no matter where you are and uh, mm. sometimes if they they just have this new um, policy or law I don't know really the details but I've heard you know there was this high profile case of Eduardo Saverin um, the oh, yeah. co-founder yeah. of, of uh, Facebook or he was involved with that the early stages of Facebook but right before Facebook had their IPO he decided to leave the country and go to was it Argentina or somewhere in South America and I think it was um, somewhere like uh, Singapore yeah, oh Singapore yeah. that's right it was Singapore you're right thank you uh, and so I mean he was a US citizen I guess or and they were saying, well, he's leaving for tax purposes. And then they brought out this law that said, um, you know, if if the government deems that somebody is trying to renounce their citizenship or leave the country for the purpose of, of not paying taxes, they will not they will still be liable for the taxes and they will be also, 
they will lose their citizenship, but they'll still be liable for the taxes. So mm-hmm. they, they really try to get you. I, I, yeah. I can't imagine how they can do that, but they really have you uh, in a precarious mm-hmm. place. <laughs> Yeah, and it kind of, I mean, I guess it shows what a bad state the economy's in if they're that desperate that they're going to go chasing chasing around people who want to renounce their citizenship. Yeah, it's so backwards. It's like, okay, I want, it's somebody in a relationship. Okay, I want to leave. This isn't working out for me. No, you can't leave. I'm going to, you know, <laughs> I'm going to hit you if you leave. Yeah. 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 But um, the other thing that that is different here is, you know, uh, when you were talking about, um, Wesley Snipes, yeah, um, and him saying, um, "Fuck this! I'm not going to pay the taxes and uh, um, going to prison." There's, um, it reminded me of a story. I don't know if you remember this. In, it was in the paper recently um, about an, a comedian, a British comedian called Jimmy Carr. Mm-hmm. You didn't hear this. So, Jimmy Carr, um, apparently, the Prime Minister David Cameron um, made a speech where he said. He thought it was really uh, morally wrong that um, comedian that Jimmy Carr was paying very little taxes because basically <laughs> Jimmy Carr's got a good lawyer mm. and he's obviously got some kind of offshore arrangement and he's paying very very low taxes mm. and and this came out in the papers. Now, what's interesting is that Jimmy Carr's initial response was apparently to say, "Yeah, I pay the minimum amount that I absolutely have to." Mm-hmm. Um, which I thought good for him, yeah. and um, and then you know this and this says something about the overall level of kind of uh, um, statism here, I suppose. He actually then totally changed track after the amount of of um, criticism he came under, and he basically did this long drawn out apology, mm. where oh, he wow. essentially. Um, I don't really know how this, I should look this up because I, we don't. I don't really follow papers, so I don't really know how the story ended. But yeah. he basically he completely backtracked and he's terribly sorry and yeah he realizes and he's mistaken and all of this kind of stuff. And this is like what he's doing is legal. It's completely legal. Mm. All he's doing is efficiently minimizing his tax burden. Um, and but wow. that is is considered here to be a moral issue. Wow. Which yeah. the funny thing is for me it's like. It's the, the absolutely opposite way around. I think the taxes are the immoral thing. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, what, they have to be able to get people at a young age to be able to flip morality on its head like that. I mean, to, to, to tell them that it is moral to sacrifice yourself for everybody else and for everybody else to be able to take what's supposed to be yours. I mean, I, I don't see any way that could be um, <laughs> consistent with what I understand about morality. But, yeah, I mean, it's just a very powerful social pressure, I guess. I mean, just the the value of taking care of the group and so forth. And even like, it's funny that you mentioned he was a comedian too, Jake, because I think people kind of expect comedians to be misanthropes in a sense. Um, Right. But he didn't get a pass on that, apparently. He is actually quite a misanthrope. He's a very, Mm. in in his his overall comedian style. But interestingly, yeah, he didn't feel like, uh, he obviously decided for whatever reason and I, I don't believe that he truly believed any of that bullshit propaganda. I'm sure it was just that he thought, oh, I'm not going to get work if I don't, um, you know, make this um, this big apology. Yeah. Um, wow. And so, yeah, apparently that, that's what happened. Wow. Very interesting. Yeah. I, I wasn't aware of that, but it is a very telling story. Um yeah, there yeah, which was... is kind of this is the this is sort of overall culture mm. in Britain. It's even worse in continental Europe. It's mm. even worse. But mm. that's why, like, just one of the things for us, like, it's interesting to come to something like Porkfest because there is no Porkfest in in Europe. There just isn't, and mm. there's nothing remotely like it. There's a few free market um, think tanks and and things like that, but they're very much on the kind of Oh, think tanky, academic y, political, yeah. organized sort of style of, of doing things. There's nothing like a sort of grassroots movement like the Free State Project mm. or um, the people um, who are doing things, you know, like all of the podcasts, uh, libertarian podcasts in the States. There's very, very little going on here. Mm. Um, so we are in a, a very different sort of um, 
culture over here just regarding ideas to do with, with liberty. Uh, obviously, um, the states, things in the states have changed and gone seriously downhill massively in terms of what real freedoms people actually have in mm -hmm. the states. But there are still people interested in the idea of liberty, and I mm -hmm. think there are more of them um, in the U.S. than there are, and Canada than there are here. Mm, I agree think? with that, definitely. definitely. Wow, that's a very interesting observation. I guess I'm kind of, you know, it's easy when I live here in New Hampshire and pretty much all my friends are liberty people <laughs> and all the podcasts that I listen to are liberty podcasts. It's very easy to live in a bubble, you know, and to sort of block out the outside world. And I, I still don't know how, how much of a good thing or a bad thing that is. I mean, on one hand, it, I, I feel happier. On the other hand, am I just evading reality? And am I not seeing what's kind of going on in the outside world? Um, I don't know. But yeah, I realize but it's I think very your different. Your experience is your reality. So if that's the environment that you're living in, I think good for you for having created that. Absolutely. Mm, yeah, you're making me feel better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I tell you, if there was a bunch of... Obviously, I've got some disagreements with some of the ideas around um, the Free State Project and, and some of those things. But nonetheless, I think it's awesome that there are a bunch of people who've mm. actually decided to make the choice to give to live closer together because they share the same values. I mean, that's like an, an intentional community. They're they're actually they've they've you know put their money where their mouth is and they've actually mm. gone and moved yeah. um, to 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 live near other people who share their values. And I have mm. a lot of respect for that because yeah. I think regardless of any kind of you know. I may not specifically agree with some of the things that they think or some of the the ideas that they have, but nonetheless, I admire what they're doing in their personal lives mm. to actually live among people who share their values. Absolutely. I, could, I think having been to New Hampshire and been to Port Fest and also um, visiting Keene, which is regarded as um, you know one of the hubs of the Free State Project, I can really, really see why it's it's so tempting why some people really want to go there mm. um because i think i mean I, even i came away thinking yeah you know like jake i don't i don't necessarily agree with some of the things that happen or some of the um philosophies that people that have but i you know if it was possible i would definitely be tempted obviously we can't for visa reasons but i would definitely be tempted to move there just because there is something incredibly refreshing about... Unless you gay marry me, Hannah. <laughs> Even then, I don't think I could. Yeah, and where does that leave, where does that leave me? <laughs> do, do I have to gay ma marry Brian then? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> or we could, yeah, I don't know. The thing is, though, I think because it's federal law, the whole um, marriage visa issue, I think even if you... Um, even if... You, yeah, even if you're in like a civil partnership or whatever you call it, um, they they still won't let you get a visa. Um, which is, I think it's just really unfair, frankly, because it's, yes. it's you know it's in marriage, you know. It like definitely marriage, it so. definitely is unfair, and there have been cases where I don't know. There was a case I read about where there was a man who. Um, had it was a gay couple and they had been together for something like 17 years and one of them didn't have the correct uh papers you know approved by the government and he was taking care of his partner who had advanced hiv and they kicked him out of the country and then the partner had nobody to care for him and it was a total oh, wow. mess and and yeah i mean i don't know i know that they do if you if you try to do the thing where you marry somebody and get them in the country they they will check up on it they will want to see pictures yeah. of you and they'll ask you if you've um you know they'll ask you questions about your relationship and stuff and to me you're right the whole thing is just so silly i wish that we didn't have to deal with it at all and i can i can really empathize with people who who are just held back from that from so many things like these yeah. arbitrary borders are holding people back from living near their friends from being with people that they might be compatible with uh from doing business all kinds of things and even traveling i mean even going on vacation becomes an arduous thing when you have to deal with all this uh paperwork passports uh, passports visas all this all this stuff so um Sorry. We get a grilling every time you want to come, <laughs> come mm. to the States and to Canada as well. Yeah, I'm sure. I know. And I, I think that's so unfortunate. So until we yeah, can get I rid of borders, 
Oh, go ahead. I, I used to live with someone who married an American, mm -hmm. and she had to go through this whole interview process where they actually had to prove that they'd had a relationship with, you know, photos and <sighs> um, Skype chat transcripts and stuff like that, and prove wow. the history of their relationship and answer questions about each other. It's like a test. Wow. To um, and and it's it's awful because. Some creepy bureaucrat reading your Skype transcripts. Ugh, ugh. And also, just the fact that you have to prove something like that. It's just, yeah. you know, and it, it's something that I really, I really feel quite angry about when I think about it. The fact that, you know, some people might be denied being together because of that. And especially if you're in a gay relationship, mm. you know, because it's just not, it, yeah, it's just not allowed. It just seems so backward that that's still the okay. case. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And New Hampshire still is one of the only that was why I made that joke, because New Hampshire is one of the only places that actually has gay marriage um, in the and they're still trying to overturn it. I mean, there's still politicians trying wow. to get rid of it. I think one of six states or something that has it. So, yeah, I mean, I just would like to get rid of borders altogether. I mean, they're they're yeah. not serving any useful purpose. And of course, they're they're one and the same with uh, with statism and these mm. tax farms yeah. that that we were discussing before. Um, yeah. Now, I, I wrote down a couple things that I wanted to go back to that you both had mentioned before. Um, one of them was um, one of them was self-employment. I want to talk about that. But first, um, you were mentioning, Hannah and Jake, that you that you both had some sort of like disagreements with the FSP and or people yeah. or certain certain people within it. And I agree. Um, I, I do, mm -hmm. too, actually. Um, and I think if I had known like it, like if there was a if there was a community that I knew of, of people who 100% shared all my values of, you know, atheist, anarchist, feminist, I don't know, <laughs> like, if there were all kinds of people who, who had everything 100% in line with my ideas, um, I would have moved there. But the Free State Project was kind of the closest thing to that that was feasible mm -hmm. at the time when I learned about it. And, and still, I found it better to have, I don't know, maybe, maybe like religious libertarians, or maybe um, minarchists instead of um, complete liberty advocates um, as neighbors, you know, in, mm. instead of the, the people, the random people that I was living with uh, amongst in, in Massachusetts. So even I think if you can get halfway there, it's probably better than just random chance. But, uh, yeah. but what are some of the, do you want to go into some of the things specifically that you, that you disagreed with? Cause I'm kind of curious if they're the same things that I disagree with. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it actually comes back to something else that we were talking about earlier for me, um, which was tax evasion mm -hmm. and going to jail for tax evasion, because I, I'm not a fan of tax. I, I'm not a fan of being forced to do anything. I'm not a fan of theft, which I think tax is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't enjoy being essentially held at gunpoint and people saying, give me your money, otherwise you're going to go to jail. Um, that to me, that's not living with freedom. However, that is the society that we live in. That that is the world that we're in right now. Yeah. And um, I, so for me, the whole civil disobedience movement and the tax movement, um, I, I can really empathise why people choose to do that because I, I can, I can really get behind the idea that they want to prove a point, and they want to highlight that. Frankly, some of the laws are pointless. They're not really protecting anyone. They're not helping anyone. They're actually hindering a lot of people mm. from living a free life. So I can really understand it from that point of view. The thing that bothers me about it is that it's, um, you know, if their aim is to get more freedom, yeah. <laughs> surely they would have more freedom just abiding by these laws or paying their taxes or find, finding some legal way to reduce the amount of tax that they're paying, um, you know, like doing it, I don't know, agorism or something, I know that's not 100% legal, but, you know, something that is not um, going up to a cop and saying, you know, F you or something like that. Like, it's yeah. not so obvious. Yeah, you're not going to have more freedom if you do that. And I agree with you, actually, I mean, this is this is why that's not my personal like style of activism that I choose to do. And, you know, I realize everybody's got to do what they want like, you know, what they feel most comfortable with. But, man, it seems very scary, you know, to engage in this really confrontational style of, of activism, like the cop blocking and the confrontations with bureaucrats and the video cameras and mm -hmm. everything. And I can't help but think, like, yeah, you're not going to have more freedom 
personally in your own life if you do that stuff. And at times it takes on almost a little bit of a, a self-sacrificial feeling. Like Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, That's the other thing that really bothers me about it. A, you're not going to have more personal freedom if you're in prison. Mm. Um, you know, you're actually going to have significantly less. Um, and in the, and it's going to impact your future as well, the amount of personal freedom you have in the future. Mm-hmm. So, for example, if I, for some offenses, if I were to commit them here, I wouldn't be allowed into the States again. Yeah. Because I have a sort of, you know, blacklisted, um, a blacklist of offenses that you commit. Yeah. Um, and I think one of them is it's either drug possession or drug dealing or something like that. But, you know, if I were, and I, I know that that is, um, Sort of marijuana possession is quite a hot topic at the moment mm. in, in a free state project. And that's something that people have used as sort of a means of civil disobedience. Mm. Um, but I think it ultimately it could severely impact your freedom in the future as well. And it just seems a little bit, um, uh, oh, just the word's gone out of my head now, but I'm thinking counterproductive. That's not quite the right word, but it's, it's uh, it's it's uh, it does seem like a big deal, like something that could really disproportionately affect your future, um, yeah. way out of out of whack with what you actually did, which is completely peaceful. And personally, f- yeah. you know, pot is not. I'll be honest, it's not the freedom that I want. I don't care. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I don't right. want to see people go to jail, and I get it, and I really feel terribly because I know that it severely affects society and it has such negative consequences upon the world in which I live and it does affect my life even though I don't smoke pot I could still get caught up in the drug war and I still pay for the drug war and I hate that and I don't want to to continue doing that but but the freedom to to use drugs is not something that I'm interested in for myself no, absolutely not. I'm I'm more interested in, for me, I'm more interested in, you know, what freedom can I get in my personal life, in my life right now, in the world as it is right now? Yeah. What can I do to live, you know, as freely as possible and live a life that I, I really kind of create a life that I really want to live as well? Mm. That That's sort of the most important thing to me. And I... I, can, I'm, I appreciate also that view might be really, really unpopular with some of the people who are into activism. Um, just because I think, I think mm. you're right when you say there is this sort of um, almost like martyr um, position that they take. Well, you know, we just had this Skype call um, last weekend where Jake has a... Would that be on the Psychology Book Club podcast, Jake? Or is it, was it just a private one? The, um... the Virtue of Selfishness chat? No, no, I'll stick that on the voluntary life. Oh, okay, great. Well, uh, okay, so so that's going to go on the voluntary life. So we we had a Skype call about Ayn Rand's book, The Virtue of Selfishness, and talked a lot about Rand and her ideas. And I do see some things, I guess, in in like some people's liberty activism that that do seem like, yeah, I'm throwing myself onto the gears of the state for everybody else's benefit, maybe for my children's freedom, maybe for my peers' freedom, but obviously I'm going to be a lot less free when this goes down, but I'm doing it so that overall we can all get more freedom. And, and I mean, I don't know. To me, that does kind of smack of self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And my, also, my, I mean, I appreciate that not everyone who's doing it has children, but, you know, my sort of argument to that is, yeah, but how are your children going to feel when you're not there? Oh, uh, yeah. Because you're in prison or jail. I know those two things. Those two things are kind of the same here. But I'm yeah. aware they're different in the States. So. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> typically <more> not. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's typically not people I see doing really like overt acts of civil disobedience that that have children. I mean, mm. I. it's typically like young single um, people. Right. But but still, yeah, that's a great point, because there are so many children that grow up with with parents who aren't there for one reason or another. And I think that is one of the worst things about um, sort of the the so-called criminal justice system, or the prison system in the U.S., is that it does catch a lot of people who have families and their families aren't helped by them being in jail. You know, they right. they um, especially for victimless crimes, possession of marijuana or whatever, um, yeah. or violation of, you know, like not not having your license driver's license renewed or some silly stuff like that um so those can really tear families apart but but yeah um uh, i i do agree with you about the kids like the best thing you can do or one of the best things you can do i think to create a freer world is is to really be there for your kids yeah and be there raise them peacefully as well yeah you know teach them sort of 
real right and wrong, not kind of what in our in our, our society's definition of right and wrong. Yeah, so I think if we talk about civil disobedience, we have to sort of touch on um, political act- activism too, so-called activism. Mm. Was that another thing that you had disagreements with? Because I think that can also be a false dichotomy. Like some people think that if they don't do, if they don't want to do civil disobedience, well, they have another choice, and that one other choice is to do politics and to try to get people elected and pass bills but i certainly don't think that that creates any meaningful change uh having having done that for a little while myself and realized quickly that there were a number of problems with using a a system a a coercive forceful system to create uh, more freedom or peace um it, it just doesn't work out and a number of practical issues always play out um which I talked about extensively with Jake on the voluntary life. So you can go yeah. back and get download that one if you want to hear a, a long conversation about that. But, but I mean, I, I think that's a false dichotomy personally, like either do civil disobedience or do politics. And I've kind of chosen different, different methods of, for my own activism, but w- yeah. talk about the politics a little bit. What do you think about that? Uh, I, I don't engage in politics at all, which again is something that's really unpopular over here. And um, as we were, as we were talking about um, when we were there for Talk Fest, um, when I, if people say, oh, you know, if it comes down to politics, and like, you know, so what side do you want, or who do you vote for, and I say I don't vote, uh, because I'm a woman, I think, I get the, oh, but people died for your right to vote argument, um, because obviously there was the suffragette and suffragist movement here, which was very prominent, and um, that that's kind of a weapon, I think, that people use now. You should uh, make um, a little business cards with Emma Goldman's uh, picture and the quote on it. If voting changed anything, it would be illegal. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And well, my response when people say that, because it's come up quite a few times now, I've actually been surprised. And my response has always been, no, they died for my right to choose whether I get to vote or not. And I, mm. I choose not to exercise that right because I just don't want to engage with the system. Yeah. Yeah, I can just picture that. Uh, I mean, of course, we hear variations of that same argument here, too. But another thing I picture is like an older veteran type, you know, maybe a Vietnam mm. Vietnam vet saying, oh, don't you know how many people died for your freedoms and the military has given you this great life that you enjoy and what a spoiled brat for not voting. And um, mm. you, you hear some unmet needs in that statement, you know, like uh, yeah. wanting to be acknowledged um, for all this, the hard stuff that they maybe were drafted into in the military and stuff and and to be to be appreciated to be thanked but uh but yeah voting is not going to uh to get those needs met for that person absolutely yeah i think also just on on this question of activism and political involvement Mm -hmm. which neither of those things they're both sort of very strong in in the free state um yeah part of the of the free state project and i guess for me, what really strikes me is the opportunity cost. Uh, even if you're interested in spreading freedom, even if you're interested in, in you know, spreading the message of freedom, mm-hmm. the opportunity cost of those things is so huge. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, for example, you know, let's say that you have the chance to start a podcast, start a radio show, write a book, create some kind of um, subscription service with information about liberty and ideas for more personal freedom, whatever it is. You can do that and you can spread these ideas and you can grow a business and you can, you know, uh, you can uh, bring um, knowledge of liberty to millions of people or you can go and be an activist and get locked up Mm. and, you know, have your own life and your own happiness totally ruined mm. and it just strikes me that obviously you know that makes news too but for me like i'm interested in in freedom because i'm interested in freedom for myself mm. and for the people who i love and for my life you know i'm not interested in it because i'm interested that you know i should become a martyr and then somebody else is going to enjoy freedom some somewhere down the line mm. so when i see that kind of activism activism it doesn't sell me on the idea of liberty because that looks to me like oh great so you know liberty is about getting put in prison um which mm. <laughs> that definitely is not what i'm interested in mm. I, I, i'm interested in <laughs> sounds um, rather find- or- orwellian war is peace and <laughs> yeah i'm interested in finding real freedom for myself which means oops 
sorry lost the microphone there a bit um which means um you know financial freedom um Mm -hmm. being being able to um enjoy your life and so forth so it just strikes me that you know for those people who are involved in activism even if they really are very passionate about spreading liberty i don't think you have to um throw yourself you know into the kind of meat grinder of the state's mm. of oppressive system in order to show other people, oh, look, look, this is what happens. You yeah. know, this is totally immoral. I'm being arrested because I'm carrying a bag of vegetables or I'm being arrested <laughs> because I'm not showing due deference to these stupid people in costumes who call themselves the authorities or whatever. You know, yeah. if you do that, it is such a huge personal cost. And there's a personal cost to you, to you, but there's also the opportunity cost that you don't get to do those projects that would spread the word if that's what you're interested in Mm. and would also give you greater freedom because Mm. you know that saying success is the best revenge and for me you know that's the way i look at the state is that Mm. like okay i got put through the prison of state school where i was indoctrinated and, Mm. and you know where i was given all this stupid ideology you know, what I want is to get to a point where my my success is the best revenge on the system that tried to to break me. You know, yeah. And I, I that that I, I hope that that's something that that people who really are passionate, because I admire their passion and I admire their commitment and their dedication. But I just think like that. I hope that people who have that passion, that commitment, that dedication, and who are throwing themselves into activism, I hope they can find a way to channel that passion and dedication into entrepreneurship, for example, mm-hmm. into creating value for people and doing it in a way that also is in line with their, their own um, passion and interests. You know, they can make liberty-oriented businesses. They can spread the words. They can work because- on themselves. I mean, like you said, I, I really like that success is the best revenge um, idea that you brought out, Jake, because, yeah, you have been put through a lot of abuse in public school and in a state of society and maybe other other factors, too. That, But if you turn out to be a happy person, I mean, wow, that's great. <laughs> and yeah, you can. There's one person on this planet that you can definitely free, and that's yourself. Yeah. And if you haven't freed yourself. The only one. Sorry? The only one. <laughs> yeah. And if you haven't freed yourself, then you have no credibility when other people look at what you're doing. Mm. That's the thing that, that really strikes me is that if you yourself are in a situation where you're kind of really, you know, um, having all of these horrible things happen to you for avoidable reasons, mm. then that that doesn't that doesn't give other people the sense, oh, I want to live that life. I really want to go and get arrested, um, you know, for, um, in order to demonstrate the, 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 the sort of uh, evilness of the state because um, that's the kind of cost that, you know, somebody, if somebody who, who wants to uh, get their own uh, freedom in their own life or they've got kids and they, you know, want to look after their kids and give freedom to them, they're never going to be attracted to that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, wow, great, great, uh, I want to say rant, but it's not really a rant. I mean, it's just <laughs> just truth. Yeah, I uh, couldn't agree more. And that's that's great that you said that. I'm really glad that you have a chance to share that with my audience because that is a crucial point, a very crucial point. Um, so, okay. And you know, just, to, just to... Yeah, please. To, to contrast it, you know, how much better would it be to create your own business, get a really good lawyer and pay virtually no taxes legally than, and, you know, be able to go and live in some country in South America and enjoy the benefits of your entrepreneurship and have a Liberty blog and a podcast and, and you know, T-shirts, whatever you want, and spread the message and tell everyone about your success. How much more um, sort of uh, opportunity are you going to have to really enjoy the freedom and to show other people what's possible. That's the real revenge on the state that tried to break you. Yeah. Mm. When you were saying that there's, there's a sort of false dichotomy that, um, you know, people think that they should either be involved in civil disobedience or political activism. I was thinking, well, actually, you know, I'm sure there are a multitude of options that people have in how they choose to live their life and what sort of, you know, liberty-centered um, and I, I use this in quotes, activism they choose to take. But 
I was thinking my philosophy on that is just um, living by example. So showing people like this is what it means to live with freedom. Mm. And that doesn't include going to prison. That doesn't include doing anything that could jeopardize my freedom. Mm. Mm. I mean, that could always happen to you. I was thinking when we were talking about this earlier that this could always happen to you, especially as the police state gets bigger and, you know, the government cracks down on you more and more. You could get caught up in it, right? Like you could, some neighbor could complain that your grass is too high or some, you could be trying, like, I just keep thinking, what if I'm trying to help somebody someday when they're sick or hurt or whatever with free aid and then I get charged with something for that? Um, Oh, totally. I, that could happen, um, although I don't go out looking for it, you know, and I try my best. Yeah. I try my best to, of course, not hurt anyone. I would do that regardless of whether that, there were a law or not. But I try my best to, to comply with their rules or whatever, because I do want to keep my freedom. Um, mm. So I, I think there's a difference, though, between knowing that it could happen to you unexpectedly and going out and sort of almost looking for it or, or doing it purposely. You know, definitely, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. It's not, it's not like, and there are, I mean, there are countless cases of that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. People who, you know, get pulled over by corrupt cops and there's just nothing they can do about it. It's driving along the street normally yeah. or whatever. Mm-hmm. People who witness police brutality yeah. and they just do the right thing and film it because, mm-hmm. you know, they can see someone getting beaten up. They're not, like, like that's not activism. That's just doing the right thing yeah. in a situation that you yeah. find yourself in. And, and I think those people, are fantastic and really brave and I, I also feel my heart goes out to the people who just get caught up in the state yeah. because there's a multitude of them but there is a difference between that and actually activism where you're looking to sort of make an example of yourself by getting mm. by getting um, thrown into the wheels you know and I think that mm. I suppose that that's the difference that I'm talking about like of course if you can't help it if you're just leading your life then um, then it's it's tragic mm. if people get um, stuck um, in, in situations where stupid uh, laws um, where about victimless crimes um, get applied to them in ways that they didn't expect to happen or whatever. But mm. I think if you can avoid it, it's not I'm saying that you should for any moral reason. I'm just saying like it just makes more sense to me to try and optimize your experience of freedom in your own life and that doesn't mean that you give any moral sanction to these stupid laws and victimless crimes it doesn't mean that you say that they're good or that you say that you support them or anything Um, just as I don't you know I don't support the public roads by walking on them I just have to walk on them because I have no choice (laughs) yeah exactly I guess it really reminds me of the conversation that we had about ostracism on the live podcast Mm. Uh, from Pork Fest, when we were talking about, um, I was saying, you know, the the right to be able to not engage is really important. Mm-hmm. And I think that applies to the state, state as well, because there are some things that we, we have to engage in in order to function in our everyday lives. But I think, for me, what is really important is choosing not to engage where I don't have to. So that includes not voting, that includes not getting arrested, that includes, you know, not doing anything that could potentially get me arrested. Mm-hmm. That is my way of not engaging with the state and living as freely as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Two people who know a lot about living free, Hannah and Jake. <laughs> I love it. Um, do you have a few more minutes or do you have to get going now? Yeah. Oh, no, and uh, we, we have a few more minutes and I also, okay. I want to make sure that um, I say something about some of the things about Porkfest that I thought were really constructive. Mm, please. Yeah. So, like, because you know we've we've said stuff about the kind of activism side, which um, which is not for me, and um, and the political um, political involvement side, which also isn't for me. But I just think it's really cool that there are people doing things, um, really constructive, interesting things. Um, some of like I don't know that much about um, some of these things I'll mention, but seeing um, in in Porkfest. The projects like people um, trading silver coins and mm. providing services to help with um, physical um, uh, precious metal purchase and storage, mm-hmm. and helping people understand, you know, what you can do to invest in uh, in precious metals as an individual investor, 
I thought that was really cool, you know, and really mm. good that that um, yeah, they were they were even they, were, they even had like um there was a vending machine which uh, mm. had um, <laughs> the money lift. Coins in. I thought it was really cool. <laughs> yeah, that's actually one of the sponsors of Pork Therapy. It's don't tread on meme uh, dot com. You can fi- see a video about the money lift there. I think. Right. And there's so a I lot of that... Bitcoin stuff too, right, Jake? Did you see some of that? That's right, and that was another thing I was going to say. You know, there's a lot of stuff about Bitcoin, um, mm-hmm. which I still don't know that much about, but it looks looks really interesting, and I, I think it's a really constructive, interesting, um, progressive um, thing to 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 look at. You know. Mm. Uh, how cool would that be? A decentralized currency. Obviously, it's not um, it's not physical um, and doesn't have those that that aspect that gold and silver have always had. But who knows? I'm interested to see how it develops. And I think it's it's also a a really positive um, thing to to get involved in because it's kind of in line with people's values, but it's also a really constructive thing to do. Yeah, it really seems to be on the cutting edge. And I think they're going to, I think Bitcoins are really going to change the world. But of course, too, there's, you know, there's other alternative currencies that are kind of tried and true that have a lot of principle backing them up. And, and not only that, but they're useful as other things like, uh, you know, metals, precious metals. So there's a lot of exciting stuff in that area. I know you're, you're particularly interested in financial freedom, um, but also in, in personal and psychological freedom too. And I think there are people here in New Hampshire who are, into that stuff too. And I've tried to find them, but, um, really what I've ended up, what's ended up happening is I've kind of found them in other places too. Like you, I don't, I don't know if I would have met either one of you if it weren't for doing pork therapy. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of one of those, um, one of those rewarding things about, um, uh, trying to spread ideas or getting out there publicly that really has brought me a lot of enrichment in my life. Yeah, absolutely. And us too as well, right? So, yeah. I mean, you know, I've, I've learned a huge amount from talk therapy. You know, it really, um, like I said in the mail out that I sent earlier, um, you know, re- I really learn something new from you every week and just mm. some stuff that you talk about. And it really makes me think about um, freedom in my own life and freedom in the world that I'm living in as well. And, uh, yeah, I, I really, and it's been, it's been great getting to know you better as well. So I'm I'm really glad that um, it's really benefited me. I think as well. Oh, thank you so much. That's really nice. I I think we all learn from each other's um, shows and blogs. Uh, I really, really mean that. I mean, and it's great to to be able to collaborate and get together and stuff. And I hope to be seeing more of you in the future. Um, I know, I I don't know if you want to talk about it, but do you want to talk a little bit about maybe your future plans for getting more freedom and where to live? Um, Yeah, Yeah, we can do. I mean, they're not really sort of uh, concrete plans right now. It's more... Just an just idea a, for now, right? Sort yeah, of. Well, yeah, yeah. We, got, we got an adventure planned. We're yeah. going to go <laughs> and check out um, spending the winter in Mexico, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. spending six months there and seeing what it's like to be sort of location independent mm-hmm. and what it's like to live uh, somewhere nice and sunny when <laughs> it's horrible here in the winter. <laughs> but it's pretty and, horrible here right now, to be honest, yeah. as well. So mm-hmm. it's going to be really nice going there. <laughs> and just, you know, checking out, um, checking it out because um, for a number of reasons, it's a beautiful, we want to be <clears throat> somewhere on a beautiful beach. There's also mm-hmm. beautiful beaches there. Um, there's the potential to live at a lower cost of living, mm-hmm. uh, which is really interesting too. Yep. And also, we would love to be able to find a place where, mm-hmm. you know, either we might one day permanently move to or maybe we'll just spend you know half the year there or something mm-hmm. but where we could be closer to other friends uh, yeah. you know who we really love and value and mm. like because of visa stuff america is is we can't really go and live in america yeah um, but we could live in mexico um and so could our friends mm-hmm. so you know we're thinking it might be fun to to just this is a bit of a reconnaissance trip to check out what it's like <laughs> living there longer term you know how we feel about being um you know in a place without some of the modern conveniences that we've got here but also how we feel about being you know location independent all of the interest and adventure that that brings too yeah i'm i'm really looking forward to seeing um what if any personal effects it has because i i've been thinking about this a lot recently because another idea that we've thrown around is um doing 
what's called permanent tourism for a few years, which mm. is where you spend a few months each year in different countries yep. um, and you get to experience a lot of different cultures. You don't really have a home base. Mm-hmm. Um, you basically live out of a backpack. Um, it's like sort of permanent backpacking, essentially. Yeah. Um, but, and I've really been thinking about sort of the personal consequences of that. And actually, I've, I've really become more aware of the advantages and the benefits of doing something like that because I think when you're at home you're you're sort of especially if you grew up in the country that you currently live in Mm -hmm. there's cultural stuff that you um that you internalize that just becomes very unconscious after a while Mm. so I'm really curious about what it's going to be like not only to live in Mexico for six months but also potentially to experience you know spend sort of three to six months living in different countries at a time and experiencing a whole host of different cultures. And and I think, I'm, I'm hoping, and I, I, I have a feeling that what it's going to do is actually put me more in touch with myself. Mm. Because once you get rid of all the, the cultural stuff um, and the conceptual stuff and these ideas about, you know, these ideas that you grow up with about how the world should be and how people should behave, and sort of what customs are right, and all, all this kind of stuff that has a lot of more weight in your own society, but actually is completely different when you go somewhere else in the world. Mm. And all these beliefs about what life should be like, and you know what success is, for example, what happiness is, what love is. I think it's going to be really, really interesting to kind of almost like shed all those layers and have a chance to say, okay, okay well, what what do I really think? You know, without any of the sort of restrictions of having grown up in England and growing up with British culture and mm. you know I mean there's a lot of kind of stereotypes and cliches about you know people are really repressed and it's sort of stiff British <laughs> upper lip and everything and I, I think they're cliches because to a certain extent they're true and you know there are other parts of our culture that I'm, I'm not sort of such a, a fan of as well and I'm, I'm really looking forward to experiencing a different culture and seeing what effect that has on me personally. Mm-hmm. And whether it's helpful for my self development and my my sort of personal inner freedom, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you can literally become who you are instead of who exactly. those around you, you know, kind of steer you into becoming. Well, yeah. that's that's really interesting. I personally, I feel a little bit. Um, I don't know what's the word to use. Like scared when I think of um, not the thought of not having a home base makes me feel uncomfortable. And I like, I love having a house. Like I love having a place where I can go and and know that it's always going to be there pretty much. And, and, um, it, it's scary to think of traveling, but on the other hand, I can really see how, how that might be true to just free yourself of all the cultural influences. Just don't have a culture, you know, that you're in all the time. And, and, and you'll notice the things that you don't like about what, you know, what, what was sort of imposed on you. I, I, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so, you know, it, I'm really interested in what you find from this trip. Maybe we could do another review like, uh, six months after, you know, or, or I don't know, after you, after your winter in Mexico and, and some more traveling and see how some of the things that you've observed, would that be cool? Yeah, we can, yeah, we can, we really can also do one while we're on the beach as well. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yes. Cause I would, I would like to, I would like to come visit at least to spend some more time with you and see what it's like. Um, I did go to Mexico personally once a couple of years ago. I, there were a lot of things about it that I didn't find so comfortable per- personally, like it was too hot for me even in the winter. And I didn't like not being able to drink the tap water and and you know throwing the toilet paper in the trash can next to the but those I mean when you think about freedom (laughs) that those sound really like minuscule in comparison although the one thing that does seem like kind of a bigger deal is um you know I would see a lot of like I remember laying on the beach once and I saw cops with automatic weapons walking up and down the beach and that was a scary moment that was a little uncomfortable for me um so but I know that that parts, you know, Me- Mexico is not all the place that I went to, you know, and it's going to be different. And the U.S. is a police state, too. And so sort of what do you do? <laughs> yeah. You know, what yeah. do you do? That's the big question. So um, as you can. <laughs> what's that? You live as freely as you can. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, 
you know, and if you ever wanted to come visit in New Hampshire, if you're doing the permanent tourism thing, I would be happy to host you while I'm here, of course. Anytime. Oh, we would love That's that. That's great we to would, hear that because yeah. we've already talked about that. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good. No, no, we, Good to know. Yeah, like, like Hannah said, we, we, well, I, I too have also just really, really enjoyed getting to know you and I, I really um, value, you know, your take on, on things through both through your show and also just through talking to you. And mm. In a sense, like at the moment, our free state project is is kind of on the internet. That's where we mm. that's where we've managed to connect with people who who really share our values and and uh, it's you know, a free state of mind, right? I've I've yeah. always hated that name. Is like a free state. Oh, it's an oxymoron. But no, I think of it as a a state of being or a state of mind. Yeah, and so you know it, it's that and that's wonderful to be able to do that. That's another thing that I I think is is uh, is great to do if you can to to find like minded people. Mm. Um, through through the internet and and you know if we can combine that in future with an opportunity where we find somewhere that's cool to live too then mm. it would be just awesome to be able to have a an intentional community of people who who had similar values and um or, or living in a place that provided uh f- freedom benefits that that they don't get <laughs> at home Freedom benefits. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> That's a very intuitive phrase. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Because why shouldn't you choose your neighbors? I mean, why should you just like most people go through life and uh, their friends become whoever they happen to work with randomly or go to school with. And, you know, their neighbors are whoever lives in the same neighborhood. And, you know, usually they socialize with them. And that's that's a little too random for me. Like I, mm. I want a little bit more purpose in who I <laughs> spend the most time with. And Jake, yeah. you know, you and I talked about this on at Porkfest, but you know, you had this show about investing in friendships and it's like, it, mm. it makes total sense. If you're going to spend a lot of time with people, make it the people that you really click with and really connect with based on shared Absolutely. values. Yeah, uh, Absolutely. And I would, you know, this is all stuff that we're still thinking about and, uh, and mm. still, you know, thinking like what what are the options, what are the opportunities, and we we're very open minded about it. So, if people who hear this have feedback about it. I'd be really interested to hear it too. You know, mm. um, other people who have thought um, about similar kinds of plans and stuff. I'd love to hear what other people's views are. Or well, people who actually have experience with this. Yeah. Well. Yeah, yeah, because you're not the first people to think about moving to South America for more freedom. The first gringos to think about moving to Absolutely. South America. Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, definitely. Let us know what you think. Yeah, and uh, can you do you want to give out your email addresses on the I would air? Love to. Yeah, okay. yeah. Mine is Jake at thevoluntarylife dot com. Mm-hmm. Um, my website is thevoluntarylife dot com. That's where you can find the podcast and all the previous episodes. Mm. Um, my email is Hannah, that's H-A-N-N-A-H, at becomingwhoyouare.net. And my website is www.becomingwhoyouare.net. Great. Yeah, and, and please visit their websites and enjoy their content too, because I can't say that enough, because I it's it's so awesome to have somebody or two people who are really you know, interested in a lot of the same things that I am, but I can also learn new things from. Um, and so it's, it's just been great to listen to your stuff and read the blog and, and absorb all that content. And just, we all lift each other up and make each other freer, I guess you could say. Yeah, absolutely. I would, absolutely. I would 110% agree with that. That's definitely been my experience. Mm. Real quickly, I wanted to ask you one more question about this, um, floating island that's man-made and how it relates to personal freedom. I saw this article the other day, um, and it's from, let's see, it's it's from WCYB.com. Just to read you a little bit of it, uh, do you crave the seclusion of your own private island but hate being tied down to one place? If so, an Australian firm, oh, excuse me, an Austrian firm... <laughs> Australian economics. I'm getting into the wheels off liberty here. <laughs> that would be something. <laughs> if so, an Austrian firm has developed a solution to your troubles, a man-made floating, quote, island, complete with two small diesel engines for where, whenever you fancy a change of scenery. The oval-shaped Orsos Island has been designed to combine the mobility of a yacht with the comfort of a house. It offers six bedrooms spread over three floors and a thousand square meters, nearly four tennis courts worth of luxury living space. And you can have this all for a mere six million dollars. <laughs> what do you think? Six million dollars. Yes. Yeah. It's more price to pay for your own island. <laughs> I think if you're going to have, if you've got six million to spend, you might as well just mm. get like four or five properties around the world and just fly between them. Cause <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, that sounds amazing. 
but um but you're still yeah, gonna have to deal really, with I stuff really on <laughs> you'd still have to deal with stuff like about living on the sea right like internet i mean that's one <laughs> for well it's funny you should say that <laughs> because yep. we have actually debated um the uh, question of, of living on a yacht. Oh, uh, you've debated it. <laughs> let me put it another way. I've debated it. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah's watched me debate it. <laughs> um, but, you know, my um, not so cunning plan is to gradually introduce this topic. To... <laughs> Hannah has said that if there's a house cat, sorry, if there's a boat cat, then, you know, <laughs> she might be up for that plan. Um, <laughs> But since I can't even sail yet, it's not really a question at the moment. So, <laughs> so, but I just thought, like, I just thought it'd be quite cool if we were going to spend, you know, if we were going to be really location independent. Because mm-hmm. I understand what you what you mean, Stephanie, about you know, it's nice to have your place and to have your staff and yeah. to have somewhere to go home to and yeah. stuff. Yeah. So I was thinking, well, wouldn't it be cool to have, you know, to have a boat like that? Because mm. then you'd have your stuff. But then if you wanted to just go down to Argentina or something, then go down the coast mm-hmm. yeah so. and actually it's funny because before like earlier um i don't know starting maybe a year ago or so i had heard on free talk live there's a sponsor of free talk live which is the other show that i host on sunday nights and mm-hmm. they it's this company that's not really a company even it's um some kind of a board or an organization they're secret sort of agenda or not so secret agenda is that they are Christian missionaries and they want people to have these little boats so that they can travel all around the world and spread the gospel of Jesus. And, but on on the other hand, they also have sort of a secular branch where they, they have plans for a fully functional um, life yacht, essentially. It's made of concrete, so I don't know how, how well that goes. but um, Concrete? <laughs> yeah, it, it actually floats, apparently, and it has a lot of, um, they have a lot of plans for, like, desalination of water, and supposedly there's a greenhouse where you can grow food on board, and you can um, pull up to any beach and extend a little uh, plank out that you can drive a vehicle on shore, and so... It's a, it kind of sounds great, like you can go anywhere if this all works according to plan, of course. I The only way you can get one of those, however, is to go work and build them for other people for Ooh. a year or so and join this council where you have to pay, I don't know, some amount of money to get into it. And it, it seems like a little bit difficult to get in. They don't just sell these boats. You'd have to actually go and, and put in some labor. But for this this other company who made the $6 million uh, floating island, <laughs> they actually are selling it. So I think it's interesting. And I'm, I'm, I'm interested because you know, there was a Seasteading Institute and they've kind of wound down a little bit over the last couple of years and they were promoting sort of options about sea life. And now there are a bunch of like sort of companies and organizations that are coming out with, this is how um, somebody could live on the water, a a much freer life. And I'm just interested in that. So I'll be following it. I just wanted to see what you mm-hmm. thought about that. Well, I think, I think it's really interesting. It's funny that you bring it up as well because we, last year, we actually saw a guy who has done something similar and built his own sort of floating house island huh. um, out of recycled bottles. And <laughs> oh, wow. Amazing. The whole thing floats on several layers of recycled bottles. It's, it's pretty amazing if wow. you see it. But this guy, I think it's an American guy. He wasn't actually there when we went. It's another guy who showed us around. Mm-hmm. But he's built a whole house on this island, and um, he's got a garden. I think he catches rainwater, doesn't mm. he? So, like, his shower and everything. Mm. He's got his own water tank. I think he grows his own vegetables. Um, what else did he have? A very yeah, aggressive chickens. duck. Oh, no, it was a duck, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, but it's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. And this thing is just floating. It didn't. Um, it didn't look very comfy, though, did I, it? Well, I think it probably. It's fine for one person. It's pretty small, mm. but um, I, I don't think it's pretty. It, I don't think it's particularly seaworthy. I think the aim is to make it seaworthy one day, but right <laughs> now it got quite damaged in a hurricane a few years ago. So he's sort of mm. rebuilding it at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I thought that was really cool because that was definitely an example of. I mean, I don't know what his political leanings are or anything like that, but. He seemed to very much have done it from, that was just something that he wanted to do. That was the way that he wanted to live. So Mm. he was doing it from the angle of personal freedom, which I thought was awesome. Mm. Interesting. Start saving your bottles. (laughs) (laughs) But it strikes me that uh, I think some of those ideas of 
of actually having a a vessel that you could literally live out at sea. Mm-hmm. And that strikes me as being something that you need a lot of resources mm-hmm. and yeah. I can't imagine it being that much fun either, you know, just being stuck out there mm-hmm. trying to make it work on 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 your floating concrete tank, you know. Well, Whereas- Jake, one of the reasons if you, if it has three bedrooms, you know, you could have three different, you know, c- people or couples living in there and each one of them could chip in a couple million and there we go. Yeah. <laughs> it seems to me that, you know, if you live on if you just get a boat and you have the opportunity to move around, then, you know, you can stay in a nice port and a nice um harbor or marina or somewhere. You can enjoy, you know, the coastline of Mexico or Chile or Argentina or wherever it is. And then if things get weird politically there and you decide this is not a place that we want to be anymore, mm-hmm. you can just go up the coast and go somewhere else. And, right. and to me, that that would be um, a real sense of freedom, but without having to kind of live the sort of survivalist lifestyle yeah. of being out in the middle of the ocean. Uh-huh. Like, don't I, I? That sounds like a lot of hard work to me. I, I was thinking actually, you know, it, it kind of reminds me of people who go off the grid. And um, again, I can completely understand why they might want to do that. But I, my personal feeling about it is that it does, it actually limits your freedom more than it promotes it. Mm, And I think, you know, freedom is all about having the choice to do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, freedom equals choice, basically. So the idea of being out on a boat at sea, you know, you have very limited choices in that situation. You have limited choices about who you see. You have limited choices about where you go because you're on a boat at sea the whole time. Mm. Whereas if, like, the really important thing is that you you have a choice. You have a choice to be. I mean, it's well, and when you're, ti- when you're tied down to making all your own stuff and growing all your own food and doing everything, sewing your own socks and everything, you you're forced to spend your time, you know, kind of, making it so that you can exist rather than having yeah. other right. choices to work on yourself or pursue interests outside of basic necessities. Yeah. yeah. And I'm a huge fan of the division of labor and mm-hmm. I really enjoy being able to, you know, eat lovely food in a restaurant that we find somewhere or go and um, find an interesting market and sometimes go to a big city where there's nice shops and mm-hmm. be able to enjoy all of those kinds of things too. But if you're out in the middle of the ocean, then you kind of your economy is limited to those six people on this concrete um, barge, <laughs> with it, and that doesn't yeah. sound very much fun. You, like right. when it comes to food, for example, you have to have you have to grow your own food. You've got to plant it, wait for it to grow, nurture it, tend it. 